All right, let's bow for a word of prayer as we get going. Gracious and loving God, may a spirit of love be with us and through us, and of discern your spirit of discernment, of wisdom, as we seek your guidance, as we seek to study your way, your ways which are different than the ways of our world. And today, getting a little glimpse of what it looks like to do some things that aren't always easy, to live in the hard things of life. So Lord, we pray uh, a spirit of openness as we spend some time in your word. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I think this opening story really is pretty fitting in here. It says, a few years ago, a mission agency was looking for recruits. They ran an ad showing a missionary fording a river in a poor section of Africa. And I'm reading right directly from our study here. The man was struggling under the weight of a heavy backpack in the heat of the sun. The caption under the ad read, In high school, John was voted the man most likely to succeed. Now, look at him. Clearly, John had a different idea of success. You know, we all know the world's standards of success, and they are not the same as God's. And they change over time. If you were to ask somebody 40 years ago, they said, you could, your son could be the starting quarterback, or who would have been a big team 40 years ago? Uh, the Redskins or the Cowboys? You know, the, you know, we talk about some of the quarterbacks now, those weren't as, you know, Tampa Bay wasn't a big team. Well, they were a joke 40 years ago, but so say, you know, the Redskins or the Cowboys or the Steelers, you know, some of the big franchises. Your son could be the quarterback of the Steelers or, that was for Linda Mann, who's not with us tonight, or... Uh, the president of Harvard. Forty years ago, overwhelmingly, we would have said the president of Harvard. I still would overwhelmingly say the president of Harvard for myself. I mean, for my girls. Now we'd probably say the quarterback of the Steelers because we change. But obviously, those are very successful, right? If, if you have a child born, you say you could sign him up to be a heart surgeon, would you do that right away? What would we say? Yep. All right, you know, sign me up for that. And you see something like this. In high school, John was voted the man most likely to succeed. Now, look at him. I'm trying to think of, I can't, I was trying to find the reference from the dean of the chapel at Duke University. He's a Methodist bishop, but I couldn't find it today. It's a name that some of us, some of you have probably read, but that's irrelevant now. This was about 10, 12 years ago. I mentioned this in a sermon once. He got this irate phone call from a parent, uh, about, from a parent of one of the students that was very active in the Methodist ministry there at Duke University. And he said, my daughter is graduating magna cum laude from Duke this year. She should be going to an Ivy League school next year to start her master's. But she is going to Africa to dig water wells and water ditches with some Christian mission organization. This is not what I wanted my daughter to do. And so what he did, being wise and discerning, he just turned it around. He said, let me ask you some questions. He said, well, did you guys grow up going to church or did you take her to church? Well, yes, we were very active in whatever name of the church was. Okay, and did she go to youth group? Oh yeah, very active. And did they go on mission trips? Oh yeah, they went on mission trips and we were very active and I was a, a, an elder at the church yeah, and all this kind of stuff. He said, you raised a Christian and are upset that God has called her to serve. But you can see why the dad is thinking, she should be going to medical school next year. She should be going to, you know, be an engineer. Whatever, whatever it is, I don't know what it is she studied. And this is a true story. He said, you're upset at me, but you're the one who raised a Christian. And she's following what you guys obviously taught. And he said, so I would say to you, good job, mom and dad. But it's not necessarily the way the world sees things. And so Paul speaks not just about how our calls aren't necessarily, this is my word, not Paul's, aren't necessarily sexy calls. You know, in the terms of they're not like something you'd always wanted. 
You know, it, it's kind of like what I, one of the things I've often helped with is in uh, committees that, in this Presbyterian, the last Presbyterian, Presbyterian before in Texas that oversees seminary and people who want to go to seminary and want to start the process and uh, go on to be pastors. And you have some, especially who come from big churches, and they think they're going through seminary and they're going to immediately hop to the 4,000 member church. And I'm like, what's your role going to be there? Do you think all of a sudden you're going to graduate and you're going to go in as the senior pastor? Oh, no, no, but maybe the senior associate. And I said, no, no, it doesn't work that way. I said, you might go in as an associate of like youth, but otherwise, no. Most calls are, you know, first prez, name the small town. Yeah, just, you know, or whatever, you know, uh, Trinity Presbyterian in Eloy, Arizona. There is no Trinity Pres in Eloy, Arizona, but uh, Community Pres in Coolidge, Arizona. That's a real church. It, and, and that's nothing wrong with that. But we ha- God's calls are not our calls, and it's, it's different. And it's not just a matter of biding time, but those also teach you how to be pastors. But we face struggles, and Paul tonight, as if you've read it, and we're going to read it in a moment, and I think most of you probably read through it at least or skimmed through it, When hardships or difficulties enter your life, do you sometimes feel that God has abandoned you? I think it's a normal human reaction, is it not? When we face some real trials, God, I, you know, I I go to church. I do this, I do this. I do this. But name the hardship. And some of them are really rough. That, that's tough. And I think sometimes we, this is why I'm, I have a real problem with what's called the health and wealth gospel, where people like, if you just love Jesus, Jesus is going to bless you. And you see this sometimes with the preachers on television. And sometimes I'll say to the girls, look at this. This is the opposite of Jesus. But I said, he's got really nice hair though. And I bet he drives, you know, and, you know, he, he, he just a shiny, that shiny suit and everything. But ministry is not always sexy. <laughs> ministry is not always easy. It's, it's tough. And Paul, whom we revere, had some really rough times, and we're going to read about that. But think about, real quick, and then we'll take a look at the first Corinthians passage, and then we'll talk, and then we'll look at the second Corinthians. Moses. Moses never entered the promised land. He saw it from afar, right? There it is. I can't seem to get there right now, but there it is. And he died before they ever got there. Moses struggled all the time. God, I can't speak. We often forget. Moses was a great stutterer had a real problem, real speech impediment. So who spoke for him? Hi, I'm his little brother Aaron. I'm going to speak for Moses today. God, I can't do this. I need some other people to help me. God calls elders to help him, right? Moses always thought he failed. How many people in the history of the world are more revered than Moses? If you hear the name Moses, your immediate reaction is what? It's, it's positive, is it not? Of course it is. I, that's what I'm saying. You, know, you don't think of anything negative with Moses. You immediately, he goes, you know, he, it's like there's Jesus and there's Moses. But there's, not, there's very few we would ever put above Moses, right? Just in terms of respect. But it was hard. But he continually said, okay, God. And he wrestled with it all the time. Like when he came out of the mountain and there was the golden calf, he just is kind of like, all right, I've had it. Screw him, God. I'm sitting down, and you just kill him. I'm going to watch it all because he's so frustrated. That's what, I mean, it's all this, you know, all this misery, all this brokenness. It's not always easy, but yeah, we look back, and we say, wow, Moses was absolutely amazing. But that's what God does with us. That's Paul, and Paul is, you know, today, these two passages help us understand life is not always easy. Ministry is not always easy. Serving God is not always easy but it's worth it. All right, let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 
8 through 13. Uh, 925. 925. You guys with me? Starting at verse 8. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have begun to reign and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we might also, or we also might reign with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to tie in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. This very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we also or we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. Wow. Wow. We're going to take a look at that. We'll read the other passage in a few moments, but we'll stay with that passage. How would you describe his mood in the, in the, at this point? Dour. Dour? Depressed? He's also being a little snarky, too. He is being a little snarky. Oh, you know, you guys got it all together. The Corinthians were takers, and they didn't think that ministry should ever be hard. And it's one of those, oh, well, you're an apostle, Paul. It's easy for you. And Paul is saying to them, essentially, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Based on those verses 8 through 10, how do you think the Corinthians viewed themselves? The Corinthians thought of themselves lowly? No, it's the opposite. What? Fools for Christ? Well, Paul thought of himself that way. How, do you think, how does he think the Corinthians thought of themselves? Regal. Regal. Better than the rest. Paul was really kind of getting after him here. Have you ever walked into a church and you felt out of place? You felt like it was a country club church and you thought, like, I'm, you know, I'm not sure where to sit. I don't mean just kind of like you're nervous, but... You just felt out of place like, oh, I need my three-piece Armani suit on. It kind of like a country club. I think the Corinthians at this point are doing this a little bit. Looking at number three, we normally view wealth, wisdom, honor, and strength as desirable, right? I like all those, don't you? I want to be wealthy, wise, honorable, and strong. Sure. Why do you think Paul scolds the Corinthians? Well, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Those are, those are like, uh, or those are outward realities. They're not really, they're, they're not like what's in the heart. Who are you? What do you really value? Humility? Okay, and remember the Corinthians, their background, you know, they're, they're going to be mostly, at the, I mean, now Corinth was a broad place, but it was Greek, so it would have had, a lot of these people's backgrounds would have been pagan, would have been, you know, they're Gentiles, that's why I remember God was no fool with having Paul, because Paul could speak right to the Jews, Paul could speak right to the Greeks, because he grew up in both worlds. Do you remember what Paul said the cross was to uh, the Greeks? He said it was blasphemy to the, Jew, to the Jews, and what did he say it was to the Greeks? It was foolish or stupid. The idea that God would die on a cross, that's so stupid. Because the Greeks thought of their intelligence level. That was, they're so wise. And so Paul was hitting right between the eyes, because again, Paul had grown up with all their thought. He knew all of it. So Paul is trying to lay the groundwork and say, just being a Christian and saying you're a Christian and showing up on Sunday, that's not what makes you a Christian. 
It's, it's an action verb, too. What are we doing with that? And he portrays the life of an apostle. Did you notice that? Where I think it's one of those we view, you know, they probably viewed it as, oh, this is a great title, and that means you're special. But what Paul is saying is if you are this, life is rough. It's not easy. And this is, Paul had a lot of ministry still left to do, and so Paul saw a lot. Now granted, think about it, Paul came from this upper echelon, and his height of popularity would have been right at his conversion. He was beloved because Jews started really disliking this group called the Way, you know, these Christians. And so Paul was popular amongst the Jews, and then Jesus came into his life and turned it all around. And so he lost everything in terms of worldly things. And we'll get the second passage from the second Corinthians really brings it on home a little bit, uh, rounds out that passage. But I was reading in this, these are the old layman's Bible commentary by John Knox. I don't know if any of you ever read these. These are still good after all these years. Um, this one was, I think, from 1959. That's like 200 years ago. I'm kidding. I know, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, but these are still, these have some really good, I like these because uh, they're really, some really good stuff. So here it says, to be clear that he meant to include both Apollos and Peter as apostles, the word apostle in the New Testament and the early church did not always have the specialized meaning it has come to bear in the church today. Paul here uses the word in a broader sense than just the 12 apostles. He means any leader in the church sent by God. Elsewhere is in Galatians and then 2 Corinthians. Paul insists on his right to the title apostle, but here he highlights other words. He also said workmen, servants, stewards, trustees, this was a good time to remind the Corinthians that the apostles were by no means so conceited about themselves as their partisans were. So Paul reminds them that God is his judge, as God is of every person, that before God we all stand on level ground. And so those last, the verses we were reading, Paul has partial sarcasm. When Paul seem, what Paul seems to be driving at is that it's so far from being, so far from being a very important personage, the apostles are at the bottom of the heap. The great difference between the apostles and the run-of-the-mill Corinthian Christians is that the Corinthians were dead-end receivers of grace. Like babies, they thought only in terms of, what do I get out of it? But as he's saying, the apostles were outgivers, sharers, builders, and workers. One of the things you find about Paul often is Paul does not mince words. Paul shares what he thinks, and that's the beauty of it. And Paul does it in love. But it's one of those like, you know, the, the teacher or the, the coach or the parent who says, you done screwed up, but they're on your side and they want what's best out of you. And that's the way Paul is. Well, let me ask you this question. Whether you love God or not, but say you are a follower of God, how do you think you'd feel towards God if he allowed you to be homeless, hungry, thirsty, ill-clad, brutally treated? How do you think you'd feel towards God? Betrayed? Not wanted? We should feel, but the struggle with it should feel blessed to suffer for Christ, but the human side of us would say, I don't want this, God, what's going on? Or you'd also, but you might question, God, did I do something wrong? Did I dishonor you? Oh, when we say to God, yeah, you want too much out of me, and God says, look at the whole Bible. It's filled with people that don't know how to do anything, but I equip them to do it. Like Moses. We think Moses had it all going on, but I just shared a laundry list of things that he had difficulties with. But God said, no, I've called you, so run along and do what I told you to do. I think some people would question the existence of God placed in that position. 
Okay, some people might question the existence of God. And I wrote that, I wrote that down in my notes. You start to say, God, are you even real? Are you there? I think that's a very human response. Have I been wrong this whole time? God, are you even real? Yeah. And the Jews did that at times when they started going through struggles. They thought, or maybe God had removed himself and now he's the God of somebody else and not them. So God, are we, have we been fooled this whole time? Are you not even real? No, good question. He, God has a reason for it because God is all-knowing. He's all-knowing. Yeah? That's, that's the... Uh, that's the compliant servant <laughs> way of looking at it, but that's a struggle. Well, let's take a look at the Second Corinthians passage. Let's jump to there. One thing about, you know, having choir right after this, we don't waste no time. We got we to gotta move along. Uh, what did it start with? What verse? verse? Okay, so it's page 938. 938, chapter 6 from Second Corinthians, starting at verse 3. 3 through 10. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in trouble, hardships, and distresses, in beatings, in prison, imprisonments, and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love. And truthful speech and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. So in this in the first passage we read from 1 Corinthians, we're dealing with a passage where Paul is kind of saying, oh, you think everything's great for us and you guys have the hardships. He said, trust me, you're essentially receiving the grace and you offer nothing in return. You're not living out that grace with others. You just say, what's in it for me? Very human, right? Because when we read that, we realize that's like anybody who just wants to consume and never wants to do, because being a Christian, it's one of those, okay, the Reformed tradition, our, our tradition, we are big on, on doctrine. You know, what, you know, it goes back to our roots in Geneva, Switzerland, and then the church spread mainly at that point, then up to Scotland, and of course to the Netherlands. And you always have the smartest Christians in, the Scot in Scotland and the Netherlands. Uh, but our branch were the nerds. We're the brains. We were always the doctrine people. But I will tell you, and I think Paul would say this at the end of the day, I don't care what your doctrine is if I'm not seeing Christ. Because that's why Paul says, you know, I had all this other stuff, all the religiosity. I understand all those things. And I do covet my tradition. I covet that we were required to study Greek, Hebrew, all that stuff. I didn't covet it at the time, but I coveted that we were forced to do it. But the thing is, it's what is doctrine if it's not living and breathing in you? I don't want to hear the right answer about the Trinity. I want to see God living. I want to see where God is. And I think Paul is trying to share that. And so he's saying, listen, we face these hardships, yet this is what the world sees, but this is the reality on the other side of the coin. He says... Um, Known, yet regarded as unknown, meaning we're known by God. Dying, yet we live on. Beaten, yet not killed. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Listen to that. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Have you ever known somebody of faith that's in a dark place and says, but God is always good? Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, but yet having everything. It's the dichotomy of the world. It kind of reminds me of the Beatitudes, does it not? Blessed are the peacemakers. Not the ones with the biggest guns, but those who are able to make peace. Now, we live in a, in a messy world. I'm not getting into just war theory or anything right now. 
But Paul is saying that God's kingdom is a different way of looking at things. So, after Paul's snark in the first one, and then you see these, what details do these verses add to our portrait of Paul's hardships? What does it say about Paul? Paul's been through a lot, right? Strong and endurance. You just talk about the beatings and stuff like that. Yet Paul remained faithful. I look at my notes sometimes. I'm like, I have no idea what I meant by those three words. You know, when I'm looking at my notes, I'm like, I have one that says, oh, I know what this meant. Okay. Okay. A revelation from God. You know, well, often it's like I literally can't read my chicken scratch, but I can actually read the world, words. And I was like, I have no, there's two words specifically. I'm like, I don't know why I wrote those. Uh, okay. Think about this with your profession. Think about also about this as a Christian. But think about your profession. When you look back on the best days of work in your life, were they the easiest days? No. They were often the hardest days, weren't they? I look at ministry, and we're all in ministry. We're all in ministry. We just have different calls. Our calls are different. But I look sometimes at those days where I'm so exhausted, where there's already something, and then you get a call. Somebody's been in a bad car accident or something. And you go to pray or meet with family or whatever, and you're just spent. And you say, God, thank you for using me. It's those kind of days. And I look at it with Paul. It's not easy but it's worth it. What was it, the army that had the, the toughest job you'll ever love? Was, that, was it the army, U.S. Army, that, that was the, one of their, like when they were advertising years ago, I think that was one of their recruiting things. I don't know if the recruits thought that, but I like the saying because it's one of those that there's value in, in tough work sometimes, whatever that is. Where a teacher, my mom taught first grade forever, you know, think about being a, a seventh grade science teacher, an eighth grade sex ed teacher. <laughs> oh, that, oh, oh, that'd be awful. Uh, that'd be hard. Uh, junior high, you never realize how awkward it is until you get away from it, and you're like, man, that was an awkward age. But, and it's exhausting, but maybe when kids say that day who's always struggled, I got it. I get, I understand it now. You celebrate those little things. You celebrate those little things. What do these things reveal about Paul's character, do you think? Okay, true believer. It's a verb. He's living, that, he's living out his faith. It's a verb, an action verb. Strong faith in God. Go ahead. He's also an excellent speaker. The comparisons back and forth make a really good speaker. Okay, so you really... It's so descriptive. You, you can picture all of it. He's, you know, speaking, writing. You understand what he's saying. Well, and the thing is, and this is why Paul had the wealth, the wisdom, the strength, the honor of the world. But he said, that's not where it's at, people. It's like the whole thing where, you know, Jesus talks about the first will be last and the last will be first. And so you think of the poverty and hardships. How does Paul maintain a healthy view of God and himself? Paul realizes it's not about him. You know, those, he's got those Jesus-colored glasses on. It's a different lens with which he sees. He sees the world differently. You know, the, um, if you look at question 8, it says in... I don't know if you looked back, and 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on not what is seen, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. In what ways are you tempted to skip over the first part, seeking glory in this present age? 
if we're honest, we don't want things to be hard. Dr. Brueggemann, um, my Old Testament professor at seminary, he's a well-respected, very well-respected Old Testament scholar, and he used to say, the, the word that bothers me the most that I observe with Christians that's nowhere to be found anywhere in the New Testament is the word comfortable. The word comfort in hardship is there, but the word comfortable is not. Well, and we know, if we look at some of our Christian brothers and sisters and what they go through in other parts of the world, oh, the rough things they deal with. We look at our troubles and our hardships. Pastor Ben, the drinking fountain is too cold today. I can't worship. Go yell at Aaron, don't tell me. Fine, I'll go unplug it. Pastor Ben, now the water's warm. Well, and the thing that's always the issue, the air conditioning. Everybody thinks like I automatically go in and I must put it to like 58 every Sunday morning. I never touch it. And we raised it. Some of you noticed it because you complained then it was getting warm in here again. But I will tell you, the coolest part of the church is the center of these sections going, it's like a strip. You want to know where the warmest part of the sanctuary is? Here in the choir, they just complain because they're whiners. They're Corinthians. That's where the Corinthians sit. That's where the first Corinthians are. They're right there. Actually, the choir loft is warm because that was not part of, there was a wall there originally. And so the vent is not the greatest there. And then you put a robe on a 290-pound man. I don't know who the 290-pound man is, but you put a robe on him right there. And then with the choir, and we just sweat buckets. It needs to be like the South where the ladies are fanning themselves and the men get all their kerchiefs out, all that kind of stuff. But, but I'm just saying the things that, you know, that, you know, at the end of the day are not really that big of a deal. Because no matter what somebody says that it's too cold in there, it will never be cold enough for me. My, my girls, Finney and Liesel, they like to sneak into my bedroom and sleep on the floor. And I don't care because I just say, as long as you don't wake me, have at it. And they'll bring in like seven blankets with, on top of themselves. because, And I'm like, maybe a thin sheet? Maybe, maybe. I had this room air conditioner that I had that I would... I set to 60, but it, do, it doesn't work right anymore. I think I destroyed it. it. It couldn't work that hard, and it doesn't work anymore. But it'd be like 60 degrees, and I would be like, oh, it's so nice. I can sleep now. And, well, the girls, you know, you'd think it was Alaska, and there was no heat, and it was January. But, it, but just the things, you know, but, the, the thi- but coming back to the Christian thing, how the things we struggle with. I remember when, how many of you were here when I first came here to pastor, it was seven and a half years ago. So I've been here seven and a half years. So some of you have been here. Well, some of you started with Moses, but uh, seven and a half years ago when I got here, I mean, the church had gone through some tough times. We know that. And I got here, and, but I remember there were some people that were, it was kind of shell-shocked, and the previous pastor had been bald and really handsome, and then they brought in somebody bald, not as handsome, but brought in somebody bald. And I think some people thought, is this like his younger brother that's taller? But I remember when I first met the people, I found people that weren't sweating the small stuff. Because it's like, these are the people that had been through a lot. You know, churches go through ups and downs. And people that just, they love Jesus and they love the church. And so it was a rough time. But actually what I started with is I thought, I see a lot of, I saw a lot of health, if that makes sense, in terms of the mentality. I think there was like, we don't know what the future of ministry looks like. That's okay. That's a healthy, that's a healthy comment. We don't know what the future of ministry looks like, because trust me, none of us do. None of us do, and COVID taught us another lesson. <laughs> you know, death and taxes really are the only two things that are the constants. But how do we look at things? And so Paul goes through all this stuff, and he says, yeah, go through these struggles, but then you see such a beauty. You know, we weren't sure of whether to start 
a, a ministry outreach of food to the homeless. And yet, how many thousands and thousands and thousands of people have been blessed by the can ministry over the years, right? Those little things that God uses. And we look at say, oh, it's not going to work. Oh, it's not going to work. But God does amazing things. Jay, who was here a couple weeks ago, you know, gave the wonderful talk. He's the missionary. And one of the things they did was a language school. And it was a way of teaching young people about English. And a lot of them came then to know Jesus. And that was because people here also bought into that. Heard that call along with Jay and wanted to support him. And I'm sure, you know, it's funny, you know, the things, Jay could tell us things that think, oh, you American Christians can't handle that. <laughs> you know, and it's true. And they would talk about it being 120 degrees, but they said, yeah, but it's like 90% humidity too. And I just said, Jay, I'm not hearing that call. <laughs> it's tough. So, as we kind of close her out, how do your personal goals and expectations need to be revised in light of what Paul says? How do we need to rethink how we live our lives or what our expectations are in the world? Don't sweat the small stuff. And wasn't there a book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, It's All Small Stuff? I think that was a book, yeah. Humble. Humility. Well, I think that's a big thing. You know, people don't, no, as I've often said, nobody, lost, or nobody became a devout Christian because they lost an argument to a Christian. People want to see Jesus. But I think the humility, humility is a big deal. Being humble. Humble there, but for the grace of God, go I. I cannot boast in anything. Yes. Okay, so one of the things that gets her in trouble the most is expectations. Marsha, what are, what's the problem with your expectations? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Hmm. I like that. Okay. Well, and I think one of the things you said, Marcia, was very wise in a biblical sense, I think worldly too. But the whole thing about expectation, I think sometimes in ministry, we get so used to saying, well, this is how it's done. This is how we Presbyterians do it, or this is how Church of the Master has always done it. Uh, there were the Ten Commandments, then there was the one tablet that said Church of the Master will do these things. You know, we get that, we get that way though, right? Those things that are sacrosanct in our churches. You know, it's interesting. It and it doesn't necessarily follow theology. Some churches that are very conservative theologically are very open and progressive in trying new things. Some churches are more liberal theologically, but they say, but this is all we do. But I think that not having too many expectations to say, okay, God, what does it look like for us? And I think, honestly, we're trying to do that right now here as Church of the Master, because we know what it means to be church and the church. We know it means to love God, Love our neighbor as ourself. I mean, that's the biblical call. But what does that look like in doing that? We gather first as a worshiping community, and then what do we do with that? What does that look like? And we have these views of what church has to be. That's why sometimes a young person could come into our worship, our worship service and say they've never been in a church service in their life, and they might be like, what is this? Is this some kind of cult? They bring out these books and they sing music out of them. Where to you guys and to myself, it's like, well, that's what we grew up doing in church. And it's, it can be foreign to people. 
Now, we're not, you know, this church, one of the things that appeals to people is more of a traditional worship, but I know some of my friends that will say to me, Ben, you guys are like holy rollers out there. He said, you make jokes in church, you can't make jokes in church. God does not like jokes. And I said, yeah, he did, he called you to ministry. So, uh, it's just my friends, you know, we tease each other. But it's just one of those, part of it's the style we're more laid back in the Southwest. But some people come to our church and they're like, is that, that's like Catholic. And I'll say, no, it's really not. But you, your pastor wears, a, you know, like a robe or something or a collar. Yeah, that doesn't make us Catholic. Or a, or a kilt. Or a kilt. <laughs> Questions or comments about the study tonight? Expectations, okay. Okay, I like that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What's the future of this church? Yeah. And it really got us to thinking about that. Sure. Yeah. No, I think, that's a, I think that's a fair question, and I think that's why we have to be progressive in, in the very good sense of the word, in what does that look like? What are we doing? And, okay, with the change and the lessening of Christianity in the culture, I don't get upset. I mean, there's certain things that upset me because I, I grew up very churched. On my church, Mission Del Sol, people would joke and call it Mission Del Cellar because they said if the door was open, a cellar was there. One of us was there. We just were always part of it. Well, but I look at it and say, it's God's world. I'm just called to be part of that kingdom in my time and my place, and I'll work in whatever that looks like. Because I don't know what the future will be. All I'm trying to do is honor Christ in what I'm called to do and be now and give it to God. And I don't mean like, oh, God will take care of it. I don't mean it like that. It's like he's called me to love and, and help serve. Okay. All right. Now, there are things that make me very sad. When I go to Scotland and I see uh, half of the churches now are like furniture stores and whatnot, and I think that's a really good looking furniture store. I mean, that does make me sad, right? That does make me sad. But I also look at it and say, God, this is your world. I'm called to serve and I will serve in the midst of that. But I think expectation, I think that's, I appreciate, appreciate you bringing up that question. Yeah, the choir people, if you need to go Get out of here. We're done with you. <laughs> oh, 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 it's right here. Yep. Or just just take a bunch to choir. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, take a bunch to choir and then I'll pass it the rest here. You know what? Here, take a couple more just in case. Beth, take a few more just in case. Other questions or comments? Okay, when we have unreal expectations for other people, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. I think that's true. It, I mentioned it, I think, on Sunday. I tell my, I never know when I say something. I said something along the lines to my girls last week. I said, if you don't expect anything, then you won't be disappointed. But when something beautiful happens, then you can always be grateful. Because I, I said, don't expect too much in the world. And when you don't expect too much, then you're not always disappointed. And I mean, that doesn't mean we don't have some, you know, we have expectations of one another. You know, if Pat tells me she had a rough day, you know, and I yell at her and scream at her that it's her fault, that she's a screw up and God hates her. She's got an expectation that's, that's not what I'm going to say, but that I'm going to say, I'm sorry to hear that. Go ahead, Pat. So I, uh, Here, go ahead and start over just so they I said my marriage uh, involved alcoholism in it, and so I joined the program for people who live with alcoholics. And one of the mottos in there was that expectations are predetermined resentments. Ooh. And listen to that. Say that again. Expectations are predetermined resentments. Like so if, if if I expect too much from God and it doesn't turn out the way I want it, then maybe that pulls me away instead of okay. keeping me close. That's good. I like that. That's good. That's good. 
Other questions, comments? Are you enjoying the study? Okay, good. Yes? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this afternoon when I walked out, I was like, it's kind of gray. It's actually nice. And my daughter said, it poured in Chandler. And I said, in Chandler, America? And she said, yes. And she showed me a video. Somebody had sent her uh, Snapchat. It's an, d- don't go on Snapchat. But it's a kid's thing. It's a, I tried it for three minutes and thought, I'm 20 years too old for this. And it was pouring in somebody's backyard in Chandler. But then like, this is what it is now. And I said, that was probably three minutes later. You know how that goes. But it was just nice because it felt actually almost nice this afternoon. Yeah, but yeah, no, I'm sure it's nice and cool right there. I'll, maybe I'll preach from there on a Sunday. Yeah, those who are cold, just go sit up there. You're fine. Um, what? Redesign. Okay, who's going to give us the 400,000? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. All right, prayers that we can lift up today. Yes. Yeah, pray for Florida. Where are you flying to? Oh, the middle of the state, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So she mentioned Florida, obviously, in the storm, but then her friend that she used to work with, Jessica, his eight, her 18 year old son died unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. His name was Jordan, so I want to keep him in our prayers.